we've called this series Meeting Our Moment. And so wherever you are, I hope you'll enjoy meeting these remarkable people and meeting our moment through them. Malcolm Geit must be the most multi-gifted person I've ever known. He's an Anglican priest, first and foremost, with years of pastoral experience, most recently as chaplain of Girton College, Cambridge. And as anyone who knows him will confirm, a deep pastoral sense pervades all that he does. He's also a poet, indeed one of the most widely read Christian poets of our time. His verse is instantly accessible, yet delivers more and more with each hearing. On the scholarly front, he moves with ease between theology and literature, as his recent widely acclaimed book on Coleridge wonderfully shows. What's more, this wizard of words is also a talented guitarist, singer and songwriter. I first knew Malcolm as a student at the seminary where I taught in Cambridge, and it was just outside Cambridge that we met up in the summer, in his garden, where in the corner a little hut stands where he goes to meet his muse. So Malcolm, here we are outside on a beautiful summer's afternoon or morning, still morning I think, and mm. this is your hut behind yes, us. Yes, so my, my little writing hut. Tell us about, you had it specially built? Well, right? yes, uh, I mean this one was built for this little corner. So I call it um, the Temple of Peace. I have to say more in hope than expectation. But um, I've got a, a Wendell Berry poem called uh, How to Be a Poet to Remind Myself Stuck Up in a Corner of That, yeah. where he has these wonderful opening lines. The opening lines of the poem are, make a place to sit down. Sit down. Yeah. Be quiet. Yeah. You know, Lovely. 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 So Lovely. that's the aim. Is, and, and I do kind of writing there. <sighs> writing is already a kind of a... Um, outwardly isolated activity. Mm. Well, of course, it's not really isolated at all, mm. because like all arts, it's in a long, rich, beautiful conversation with the past and its gesturing towards its successors. So we're not really alone when we make art. But nevertheless, we have outward solitude and this is a good place. So one of the beautiful things, I mean, you can probably hear now just a faint, distant wash of traffic on the, on the edges of sound, but actually, for those first few weeks of lockdown, it was completely still. And we could hear the birds. I don't know if you want to hear that poem now. Shall I throw it in now? Yes, let's hear it. This is the very hut referred to in the poem. Here in my garden hut, just on the brink of making some new song of all I think, a sudden thrill and ripple of true song makes mockery of my poor pen and ink. Beyond my hut, a vivid glimpse of red, a bright-eyed robin by the garden bed, sings his mellifluous and liquid notes that utter more than all I've ever said. Three busy sparrows soon take up the song, chaffinches and blue tits join the throng, a pattern of bright music nets the air and catches me off guard and makes me long, long for the joys that I have yet to sing. Long for the sudden flight, the lifting wing. Long for the songs of summers yet to come. Long for the freedom future days may bring. Though sorrows run so deep, and our brief songs are burdened still with all the ills and wrongs of this sad exile, something in us sings, sings from that garden where the soul belongs. In many ways, Mal, despite your image, at least amongst them, of being you know, rock and roller and very, um, in the very best sense, out of the ordinary, you're very traditional when it comes to poetic forms, for instance. Oh, yes, yeah, uh, very much you're, so. You're not, you're not avant-garde, no one would say that. So, and particularly the sonnet form, obviously, but also the portraits and these others that you think. Do you want, do you ever feel, oh, I've really got to, I've got to leave this particular form uh, yeah. aside, or so, why, so, this, sometimes why this you reliance yeah. on incredibly well honed yeah. and massively used forms? Yeah, partly I think it's actually the objective and intrinsic beauty of the form itself. I like, I think that things should be well made. I think that, that certain forms are intrinsically 
uh, beautiful and pleasing. And when I was younger and first trying to write poem, I thought, well, at least if I haven't got anything to say, it'll it'll stand on its own five feet, as it were, and there it will be. Um, but then I came to realise that form is a discipline that I really need. Um, you know, I, I have been known to run on a little bit and, you know, get carried away with eloquence and no, I've flow never, away. Never heard that. My mother used to say to me, you've got the gift of the gab very galloping, but she also, <laughs> she also used to say, your tongue will get you hung, you know. And um, <laughs> I began to realise that I needed form to constrain and contain and to concentrate my energy. But the, but the poetry almost happens when the bound that is to say, as, it, as the river turns, when the water hits that and this fine spray goes over and there's that sense that you needed the bank in order to kind of create that. To say that the constraints yeah. actually yeah. free you. It, you once said that you learnt or you came back into poetry when you were a young man through Cohen and yeah. Dylan. Yeah, because I was looking for this form that I'd first read in the, you know, in the kind of romantic song. I thought, well, I must, I can't just live in the 19th century. You know, I've got to... You know, so I was you know, reading lots of contemporary poems, but not finding the music, not finding the form. Well, I found many interesting insights and I certainly was shown the world in a new way. I mean, um, but uh, on the other hand, I was listening all the time to Dylan and Leonard Cohen. And I suddenly realized if you take, if you take the sheer beautiful lyricism of a poet like Byron, you know, I mean, Byron can write great stuff, but he also writes quite, trivial stuff but I don't know if you think she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes you know like who was writing that nobody except you listen to Leonard Cohen you know and you know uh, you heard my master sing when I was sick in bed I suppose that he told you everything I keep up away in my head it's exactly the same meter and it's you know perfectly you know um, so does this mean that you would put people like Cohen and Dylan up there with the greats I think or I would not every they, person where do they lead you in that direction no I think I think in the cases of Cohen and Dylan I I, I would put them up there I think the body of work is substantial enough the poems and songs have been with us long enough yeah. they've spoken again and again into so many different scenarios and come back again and again with power they've shown that they're not simply the birth of a moment you know to die with the moment that they were given they they're capable they're kind of beautifully reticulated kind of nets of meaning that are capable of catching more and more experience yeah, as we yeah, take yeah. them out yeah. to pick up the question of justice in yeah. the enormity of the injustice. I mean, I work in the States, of course, yeah. as well as in this country, and the, um, the deep-rooted racism and racist yeah. history yeah. is it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. What's poetry's gift to that situ situation? Obviously, the worst of it could be some kind of escapism or a certain kind of propaganda. Yeah. What, what do you think, what are we doing when we write poetry into, that speaks to that? First of all, we speak to hearts as well as heads and we, we motivate people from deep within. But I think much more important, we change the vision and the possibilities. Yeah. I yeah. think we open up new possibilities. Absolutely. It's strongly arguable, I think, that any act of oppression where one set of people oppress another set of people is a failure of the imagination. Yes. It's simply a failure to know what it would be like to be that person. And then if you say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and if you look at the old, if you look at Jesus' teaching in parable, it is a constant appeal to the moral imagination. Yes. And the power of a poet to put you inside, if you think about wonderful poem about his father uh, on Sunday mornings, you know, his father working hard, you know, poor, getting up early to cut the wood, to make the fires for this poor black family on a thing, you know. And how he did took his he took his father's own offices, you know, not seriously. I think he says, "What? I mean, the last the last line in those poems, you know, what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? You know. So this, you know, I mean, I anybody can read that poem, and in a sense, you could say there's no colour in that poem at all. But when you know about the poet and you know their background, and you're a white man reading this poem by a black poet who is wielding 
He's describing a poverty that you don't know. He's describing a, an extraordinary fatherly love, which if you're a Christian reader, you can't help feeling of the, the father expending himself in and through the son. Yes. Love. And it's about a son not noticing. It's about, it's about, and then here's this man whose labor you yourself as a reader will, will have taken for granted, blaming himself for taking for granted his father who labored six days a week the whole poem begins, Sundays too, he got up early, you know. Love's austere and lonely offices. That's, that's the language of high poetry. And it's the language of a certain kind of austere and lonely art and theology. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. It completely, it not thing. only unveils the sacrifices of parents for children. Yeah, yeah. But it unveiled, which we've called Carson with the film of familiarity, and echoes a theological theme. But it also alerts you to what you haven't noticed in other people's lives in your own. And then it finishes with the recognition that what is at work in this man chopping wood to feed the fires so that the house is warm before his wife and children get up is, is, is love himself, capital L. And, and the, the extraordinary choice of the word offices, which of course has this monastic reach by yes, saying indeed. your day in the office. You write somewhere, the empty hours, talking about our current situation, the empty hours may tease you out of thought, yet leave you with a poem now and then. Oh, yeah. So tell us about what thing. you've been writing. It's, well, first of all, is the, the Corona series, I think we yeah. must speak about, if you, if you would, because yeah. that's obviously speak to the yeah, this moment. Is, this has been... I wasn't sure how the muse, as it were, would react to all of this, and I didn't want to put pressure on myself on me, but in fact, I discovered that this was a moment to write and that things were flowing. Here we are. Oh, great. Yeah. I wrote this, actually, literally the day before he stood out. I just, the, the shock of Easter with closed church doors. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, Jesus is risen, you know. I mean, always, you know, he's not in the empty tomb. So it was, uh, uh, anyway, Easter 2020. And where is Jesus this strange Easter day? Not lost in our locked churches any more than he was sealed in that dark sepulchre. The locks are loosed. The stone is rolled away. And he is up and risen long before, alive at large and making his strong way into the world he gave his life to save. No need to seek him in his empty grave. He might have been a wafer in the hands of priests this day, or music from the lips of red-robed choristers. Instead, he slips away from church, shakes off our linen bands to don his apron with a nurse. He grips and lifts a stretcher soothes with gentle hands the frail flesh of the dying, gives them hope, breathes with the breathless, lends them strength to cope. On Thursday, we applauded, for he came and served us in a thousand names and faces, mopping our sick room floors and catching traces of that corona which was death to him. Good Friday happened in a thousand places where Jesus held the helpless, died with them, that they might share his Easter in their need. Now they are risen with him, risen indeed. So all these things were sort of floating around in my mind and I'd been returning to the Psalms because I wasn't commuting out, because Maggie and I were having a chance to say the offices together a little bit more. She was doing you know, all the same evening prayer together. And I was really re-engaging with the Psalter and realizing just how much it came alive. But of course, there are the Psalms of pain, there are Psalms yes. of imprecation and cursing, there's the Psalms. I became aware as I was writing this just how powerfully the Psalms cry out for justice. Yep. And how we have the habit when we read them and say, oh, it's terrible, he's crying out for vengeance on unjust people, I won't do that. Assuming that we are among the poor and the just and there's some other people we shouldn't be crying out and not thinking, wait a minute, maybe, you know, I'm the oppressor. Maybe somebody out there who is crushed by the weight of my privilege is praying a psalm against me. Maybe I have to turn that around. So this is Utica Domine, Psalm 35. The poor cry out 
Oh, help them speedily and plead their cause, though it may not be mine. The psalmist here is sure in crying, help me. But he was poor himself. Help me divine how these sharp psalms call out for change in me, lest I should be an enemy of thine and find the poor who cry to you for mercy have cried against me too. Oh, let me not be numbered with these scoffers. Lord, convert me. Show me with whom I ought to share my lot, for whom I ought to put the sackcloth on, whom you remember, whom I have forgot, that having wept with them and helped them on to better things, we may rejoice together as pilgrim souls on whom your light has shone. Has your life taken the kind of course you expected? Well, no, I, I, it's funny, I get these earnest letters now from American doctoral students asking me how I strategized my career. <laughs> you know, and I, and I never had any such thought. I mean, I knew, I, I mean, I wanted Likewise. to be a poet when I was young, and I, 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 poetry was there. I thought all vocations, in a sense, were subsumed into the vocation of priesthood, which in one sense is very true. But after I'd had uh, sort of seven years toiling in the vineyard and I was getting very dried out and I needed time for renewal and I had a Which sabbatical. The this is the, the past, this yes. was, yeah. So this was the late 90s. Um, Stephen Sykes is then our bishop, who's a tremendous encourager of me and, and of others in, in writing and thinking, said, take three months off, do what you like. Uh, I, what I wanted to do is read poetry. And I found myself so renewed by that. I that I, I, out of that eventually came my book, Faith, Hope and Poetry, after many other trials and vicissitudes. And around that time, you were beginning to uh, develop the Theology Through the Arts program, and you kindly invited me to be on a sort of, you know, thinking or steering group, that which is hugely stimulating. So having thought I'd set academia and indeed poesy aside for all the demands of priesthood, yeah. and having, you know, not engaged in those things for about seven years, I gradually brought them back in, both the academic and the poetic, and began to see them as aspects of priestly ministry. And now I'm getting to the stage where, although I've done quite a lot of academic things, I'm feeling more and more it is the poetic, it's the creative writing. Yeah. And I'm finding it is, it's more understanding that the priestly and the poetic ministry are two sides of the Indeed. same it's coin. It's to hear you say that. It's been very much as they're, they're, they're double well. I see what I'm doing at the moment was not planned at all. No, I never um, planned but, any of this. But it is an outworking of my ordination, effectively. Yeah. You begin had the great thing about, you know, how do you make God smile? You tell him your plans. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. But the thing is, you know, we were talking at the beginning of this conversation about making things new and fresh and about, about yeah. defamiliarizing and making strange and unveiling and revealing the freshness and wonders for which... Well, you know, one of the things in our charge is that we, we as priests, is that we witness to the gospel which is set forth in the creeds and it's in the witness of the scriptures. So there it's found, but which must be proclaimed afresh in every generation, yeah. I think is the phrase of the order. Yes, so that fresh proclamation is very much the vocation of the artist as well as the preacher. But if um, you could speak now to your 30 year old self, what would you say? Gosh, uh, um, so many pieces of advice I'd like to give. But I would say, I'd say something like, hang on in there. It's going to come out right. You know, it's going to keep, don't forsake either of these callings. Yeah. Uh, later on, I mean, one of the, I had a point of clarity. Again, this was around that time in the late 90s, early 2000s. I went on a retreat whose purpose was to try and distill into a single sentence what you think you're there to do. And you thought about all the roles that you have and uh, you know all the tasks and all the different you know parent and husband and priest and teacher and you know all of this but in the end i came up with a single sentence and my single sentence was to use my love of language and facility for it to kindle my own and other people's imagination for christ that was it language kindling the imagination for christ and that's on that basis that i say yes or no to anything but basically, I see my vocation as priest and preacher on the one hand and as poet on the other, as both essentially engaging with language to kindle the imagination.